I love point-and-click adventure games. Whether we're talking about the classics of old or the new generation of professional and amateur designers, there's an undeniable charm to these games, with many boasting intricate plots, brain-teasing puzzles, and an overall immersive atmosphere. But just as there are numerous games that have become loved by many, there are just as many that don't quite make the mark. Welcome to Point and Click Purgatory, the show where I look at point and click adventure games and decide whether they deserve to be immortalized in heaven or cast down into the fiery depths of hell. And right off the bat, we're going to be looking at an entire series of games. Which game series am I talking about? Well, you probably figured that out already by glancing at the title of this video. That's right, the Blackwell series. A series of supernatural mysteries built on the simple yet versatile Adventure Game Studio engine and created by indie adventure game designer Dave Gilbert and his company Wajidai Games. Gilbert and his crew have steadily made a name for themselves over the years as creators and publishers of entertaining, well-written retro-style adventure games, with Blackwell serving pretty much as their flagship series like Sierra's King's Quest or LucasArts's Monkey Island. The series started in 2006 and continued up to 2014 with a total of five games. The Blackwell Legacy, Blackwell Unbound, The Blackwell Convergence, The Blackwell Deception, and The Blackwell Epiphany. So what's this all about? Let the judgment begin. The games center on Rosangela, or Rosa Blackwell, a 30-year-old who, as the story begins, works as a freelance book reviewer for a small New York newspaper. Having lost both her parents to a car accident shortly after her birth, she was taken in by her aunt, only for her to then succumb to mental illness when Rosa was just five years old. So, having grown up like that, she's something of a socially awkward shut-in. Oh, I have three great roommates. Oh? Yes, um, their names are me, myself, and I. Um, it's a joke. Yeah, I get it. Very funny. One day, shortly after she scattered her late aunt's ashes, her life is suddenly turned upside down when she comes face to face with Joey Malone. Hello, bright eyes. A family spirit guide and eponymous Blackwell legacy. Why do they always do that? That's right. Rosa is the latest in a line of spirit mediums after her grandmother and aunt, able to see ghosts and talk to them. And it's up to her and Joey to seek out the lost souls haunting the Big Apple and help them move on to the world beyond by sending them through the doorway to infinity inside Rosa's head. Forget logic. For you, logic went out the window the day I appeared in your bedroom. As the series goes on, the two work together to investigate supernatural happenings wherever they may find them in order to help ghosts in need and take on a few spooky villains on the side as well. But all the while, several questions linger in the background. What exactly happened to Rosa's grandma and aunt that drove them both insane? Who was Joey before he died, and how did he become a spirit guide to Rosa's family? Who is the mysterious spirit appearing in Rosa's dreams? And why did Dave Gilbert think it was a good idea to put a variation on the newspaper under the door puzzle in one of these games? Hey, what is this, 20 questions? All in all, the games develop a pretty rich backstory and mythology as they go on. And you better believe the plot has its fair share of twists and turns to continually throw you for a loop. But at its heart, Blackwell is all about the duo of Rosa and Joey having to learn to live with each other and forming an unusual friendship, freely taking jabs at each other, but still doing the best they can to do the task appointed to them. Rosa in particular goes from being a reluctant heroine to a confident, full-fledged investigator, though without losing her charming awkwardness. Not that I don't appreciate the company, but why the heck are you just standing there? Oh, um, I was just admiring the brickwork. The brickwork. Joey, on the other hand, is a lovable hard-ass who doesn't take guff from nobody, even if he's dead, but nevertheless has his amicable qualities as he grows to genuinely care for Rosa, and shows that underneath that rugged exterior beats a transparent heart of bluish gold. And if that wasn't enough, the prequel, Blackwell Unbound, lets you step into the shoes of Rosa's Aunt Lauren during the 1970s, which is an interesting change of perspective, as she gonna be more different from her niece if she tried. I am so tired. I just want to relax and smoke a cigarette. Since when do you need an excuse to smoke a cigarette? Good point. The city of New York plays just as big a role in the series as Rose and Joey, however. Much like Gabriel Knight did for New Orleans, the Blackwell series does a tremendous job immersing you into several real-life locations like Washington Square, Roosevelt Island, Central Park, and so on. Furthering the parallels to Gabriel Knight, the story similarly blends history and fiction, as it involves historical figures like Joseph Mitchell, a writer for a New Yorker magazine known for his astronomical case of writer's block, and Joe Gould, a bohemian who hung around the West Village during the 60s and recited poems in Seagull language in exchange for a contribution to the Joe Gould Fund. 
personally being unfamiliar with either of these people, the games actually really got me interested in finding out more about them, so job well done. Real world figures aside, the games have a huge cast of incidental characters that you'll interact with as you go about your business. Most of them are purely there to provide information regarding your current case, but it never feels like they're solely meant to provide exposition and clues. The dialogues are natural enough that they feel like living, breathing individuals, each one of them with their own quirks and attitude to make them memorable. The ghosts, of course, are a good example of this. Some are friendly, some are unhelpful, and others are downright hostile. <laughs> right. Look, why don't you put that toy down and... Ow! What the hell? That hurt! You'll often have to piece together their identity, history, and cause of death in order to remind them that they're dead before they can move on. And you better believe that there are some sad stories among them. Probably among the worst of them is this little girl, where the mere fact that a child her age even is a ghost is so heartbreaking that even stone-faced Joey can't bring himself to tell her that she's really dead. In fact, despite the light-hearted banter between Rosa and Joey and the witty dialogues with other characters, the series has its fair share of dark and even violent moments. So faint of heart, consider your yourself warned. Hell, I'm fairly stoic and even I find myself profoundly shocked at some of the more unexpected moments throughout the series. While the story is well told and overall consistent from game to game, the first game is admittedly a bit slow to start with how much exposition gets thrown at you from the beginning, but Dave Gilbert did get better with keeping the dialogue snappy as he went on. There are a few retcons and changes that occur here and there as the series goes on, but nothing that seriously breaks the story or anything. I do have a major problem with Epiphany, where instead of following up on the plotline of the previous game, it goes off in its own direction. But I can excuse that simply because it still is an excellent finale to the series overall that answers a lot of the lingering questions and seriously left me feeling depressed when it was all over. So, to conclude, the story gets a big fat thumbs up. On to the gameplay. The basic interface is pretty much the same for the entire series or Wadjedi games in general. Mouse over objects to see what you can click on, left click to interact, right click to examine. Moving the mouse to the top of the screen reveals your inventory, and from Unbound onwards also lets you switch between controlling Rosa or Joey. The main focus of Blackwell is on investigation. Like I said, you're most often trying to figure out the ghosts' identities and details about their lives, so that means going around different locations to find clues, interview people who might know anything, that sort of thing. And these cases are pretty tightly designed, with no fluff, dead ends, or anything annoying like that. To help keep track of everything that's happening, Rosa has a handy notepad to write down important clues, which, starting from Deception, is supplanted by a spiffy my phone, or her, that also adds email and search capabilities. Before then, you constantly had to run back to Rosa's apartment to use her computer anytime you needed to look up something. So this was a welcome change, but since the My Phone appears four games in, I'd gotten so used to running back and forth between Rosa's place by then that I often forgot I could just do that stuff anywhere I want now. Force a habit and all that. Anyway, clues you've collected get updated as you learn more information, but can also be combined with one another to draw new conclusions. If that sounds familiar, it's because the whole note-taking aspect was copied from Disc World Noir, which Dave Gilbert fully admits was his inspiration. Hey, if you're gonna steal from others, steal from the best and all that. Overall, I really enjoy the series' approach to detective work. It's an interesting departure from the tried-and-true adventure game formula and requires you to put your grey matter to work in order to see the connections and figure out who knows what. Though it's not perfect by any means. Often when you're stuck, it probably means that you forgot to ask one person about one particular topic, so it's important that you go around to everyone you know to learn whatever you can. Plus, combining clues isn't always as logical as it should be. For instance, in the first game, it's vital that you combine the names of two characters who are completely unrelated, so Rosa gets the idea that one guy's name could also be a girl's name and that she could use it as an alias. Sure, there is a subtle clue that gets thrown your way about that, but it's still a stretch. Convergence ditches the clue combining entirely when David Gilbert figured people found it too frustrating, only for it to get reinstated in Deception because people missed it after all. Can't please everyone, I guess. Still, I personally didn't have much problems figuring things out, since you can always use the brute force method of combining every clue possible until you find a match, that sort of thing. Plus, in later games, you can always ask Joey for advice on where to go next. Of course, there's still traditional puzzle solving to be found as well, particularly since Rosa and Joey often have to get into places that they're not supposed to be for the sake of finding clues, which is where their different abilities come into play. Joey, of course, is completely incorporeal and invisible to most people, able to move through solid objects and go where he pleases as long as he doesn't move too far away from Rosa but at the expense of actually being able to interact with anything. There's a reason why I keep my hands in my pockets. There's less disappointment that way. While not directly interact anyway, because he does have one important ghostly ability. Blowing. Ew. No, get your mind out of the gutter. I meant as in creating a small gust of wind. Neat trick, huh? Not really. Everyone's a critic. His other major asset is his necktie, which is commonly used to send spirits to the portal in Rosa's head. I can touch it? Yeah, the only part of me you can touch, unfortunately. 
it kind of tingles. And he also has a nasty habit of screwing with wireless signals just by being near certain devices. Now, you'd think these abilities would have limited uses, but throughout the series you'll often end up in situations where you have to make rather creative use of them to proceed. And these moments are some of my favorites just for how versatile these seemingly insignificant abilities prove to be. When it comes to more traditional inventory puzzles, Rosa's your gal Friday. But these come up a lot less frequent than you'd expect. Heck, the first game doesn't even let you use items on the environment at all, and there's all of one item combination puzzle in that entire game. The inventory stuff slowly becomes more prominent as the series goes on, but never overtakes the main investigative or cooperative angle between Rosa and Joey. The way the two of them have to use their respective talents to solve the puzzles is a lot of fun either way. And even when you're just going about exploring and investigating, I found it highly worthwhile to just examine everything I could as both characters to hear all of their unique responses. There's a lot of amusing little details in this regard, particularly some of Joey's wistful comments in certain locations, or his complete inability to understand modern technology, which adds a lot to his character. Speaking of amusing details, the games all come with a variety of special features, such as creator commentary, voice acting bloopers, and achievements. The behind the scenes bits with Dave Gilbert and his crew are all quite interesting and entertaining to listen to, and you're also rewarded for experimenting to find several amusing easter eggs. Unbound, for instance, lets you call up a certain character from an earlier Dave Gilbert game. Hello? Uh, yes, hello? What can I do for you? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. Vault. Then call back when you do. What was the point of that? I don't know. His voice sounded kind of familiar, though. In any case, the puzzles are tightly constructed, full of variety and clever moments, and a lot of fun to solve. Another thumbs up for gameplay. When it comes to graphics, each Black Hole game has its own distinct look, thanks to the series having a constantly rotating roster of different artists. The one thing they obviously all have in common is the classic retro low-resolution look. Legacy has a very colorful style with vibrant, solid colors, though it's also probably because it's the only game taking place primarily during daytime, which Dave Gilbert admitted kind of made the ghosts look less effective, hence the rest of the series taking place either at night or in overcast weather. Unbound, to me, kind of feels like the black sheep of the series compared to the rest of them. There's no dialogue portraits, a deliberate choice to save on time as the game was made as a quick holdover between Legacy and Convergence, but it makes the characters seem a bit lifeless as their expressions rarely ever change and everyone looks as if they're asleep half the time. Still, the rest of the game holds up well with the backgrounds and overall darker atmosphere, but it's still the weakest entry in my humble opinion. But going from Legacy to Unbound to Convergence? Holy spook balls! it's a world of difference. The details, the color, the animation, the whole thing looks utterly spectacular, almost like a lost Amiga game or something. On top of that, the dialogue portraits in this one have a very 90s Sierra flavor to them somehow, with the mouth movements and little bits of clothing sticking out over the borders, which I personally adore. Plus, Joey's ectoplasm-eating grin never gets old, even if his character sprite in this game kind of makes him look built like a football player. Deception, on the other hand, feels like a step back. For whatever reason, this game runs at double the resolution of the previous games, but still retains the low-res aesthetic for the most part, except certain elements like fonts and close-ups, which kinda clashes with the game's style. Going back to comparing this series to Gabriel Knight, it's kinda like that phoned-in SVGA version of the first GK game, where only certain objects were actually drawn in high res. Plus, the sprites are a bit simpler looking, and Rose's walking animation makes it seem like she's a midget on stilts. But, like Unbound, it's not horrible looking overall. Especially one of my favorite bits here where Joey's partying with a club-going ghost girl. Finally, Epiphany pulls out all the stops for the grand finale and is easily the best-looking game next to Convergence. It pretty much set the standard for all Wadjedi games to come. Gorgeously detailed, digitally painted backgrounds and beautiful sprite work with lavish animation that really gives weight to the story during the more emotional moments. The soundtrack throughout the series is quite good as well, as you've been able to hear during this review. The first game stands out a lot compared to the rest due to its more electronic style, but after that the games go for a more jazzy style with some sweet saxophone music. Most locations and scenes have their own distinct tunes, and like with the graphics, it's interesting to chart the game's gradual evolution with recognizable light motifs, especially the song that plays in Rose's apartment and the game's main theme that crops up in a lot of different places. Actually, given the supernatural detective angle, the music gives the story a very strong film noir feel at times. But there's also plenty of eerie, atmospheric tunes where the ghosts are concerned, especially this one from Deception that always gets to me.
Now some tunes do get reused verbatim in later games, but it never bothered me that much because the music is just that darn good, and it works for its intended purpose. And while we're talking about sound, the voice acting is amazingly solid for an indie project. Rebecca Whittaker and Abe Goldfarb especially shine as Rosa and Joey, gradually growing into the roles and really making the characters their own. Well, he's gone. You okay? Sure. Nothing an entire bottle of wine won't fix. Well, you know what they say. Bacchus knows best. All the other actors do a great job with the incidental characters as well, and went on to become staples in other Wide Jedi titles. Dave Gilbert himself even shows up in every game voicing one or two different characters, and although it's funny hearing his voice coming out of different characters' mouths after listening to his commentary, he's actually got a pretty decent range of different voices. Miss Blackwell, spend some time talking to the poor and the downtrodden. Walk down the Bowery and speak to the half-wits and the have-nots. In one hour, you'll learn more from them than you would from a lifetime of school. However, the early games do suffer a bit from poor recording quality as the actors' voices do peak and crackle at times, but that's excusable since the developers didn't exactly have access to a professional recording studio or anything, and the performances are excellent nevertheless. So, for presentation, the series gets another thumbs way up. And after all that glowing praise, it should come as no surprise whatsoever that the Blackwell series gets my final rating of Heavenly. Each game is engaging from start to finish with their individual plots and the overarching story that slowly unfolds with each new installment, and I quickly fell in love with the supernatural detective duo of Rosa and Joey. The puzzles are fun to solve with how you use both characters' abilities and figure out each case one step at a time, the graphics, music, and voice acting are stellar, and the whole thing just has so much personality and atmosphere all its own. There's so many memorable moments I can scarcely count them. I laughed, I got spooked, I was surprised, and when the ending finally came... Well, I don't want to spoil anything, but it was a little something like... It's like they reached into my chest and pulled out my heart and threw it into the woods! So in the end, I heartily recommend the Black Hole series to anyone even remotely interested in point-and-click adventure games, especially fans of Gabriel Knight or just those who like a good mystery and the supernatural. All five games are available for purchase on Steam and GOG.com, with the first four being sold in a bundle. Given that each individual game is pretty short overall, I highly recommend getting the full set right away and playing each game back-to-back -to, -back to get the full experience. So folks, thank you all for watching this first edition of Point and Click Purgatory. Keep being awesome, and remember... Another day, another satisfied spook. watching Point and Click Purgatory, subscribe to my channel to stay up to date, and get in touch with me on Twitter and Tumblr. If you want to support my videos, go to my Patreon to send a few bucks my way every month for every video I make in exchange for some nifty rewards. That's all for now, thanks for watching, and see you out there somewhere. I never, I